All right, we are uh, teaching through this theme around the Bible. We've called it Why the Bible? Why the Bible? I don't know if anyone's ever asked that question before, but I know I have. 20 years of following Jesus, there's been many times I've picked up this book and gone, what is this really? How did this really come into being? And what's the purpose of the Bible? And, and how do I actually read it? And how do I study it? And how can I trust that this is the Word of God? And, and how do I really, if it is the Word of God, how do I apply it to my life? Is there anyone who's asked those questions on their faith journey before? I know I have. Uh, I'll just share a few random facts about the Bible, just in case you don't know. That word Bible, does anyone know what it means? It means the books. The Bible actually means the books. And this is the most copied and printed book in all of human history. This is almost also, sorry, the most sold book in history. This is also the most stolen book in history. And more people in human history, history have been killed for this one book than any other book. And so you've got to ask yourself, what is so important and what is so crucial about the Bible? And before we go any further into it, I want to remind us the goal of the Bible and what the whole goal of God bringing this, this book into being was about. The goal of the Bible is intimacy with God. That's the goal. That's the reason why this was birthed out of the heart of God. It's not just for, in, in, uh, not for information. It's not just for knowledge, but it's for revelation. It's for understanding who God is and what He thinks about us and how He's calling us to live in this world. So this is what the Word of God is about. And I don't know if you've been journeying with God for an amount of time, but you might think, oh, well, I know, I know what the Bible is. I know what it's about, so can we just go a little bit deeper? This is what Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in the 1500s says. He says, nobody ever outgrows Scripture because the book widens and deepens throughout our years. And I would have to agree with that 100%. 20 years of walking with the Lord, every single time I pick this up and read it, there is something, there is something that happens and speaks to my heart. And so we're wanting to be a church of the Word of God, not just a church of church services, not just a church of experiences, not just a church of emotion, but a church that's founded on the Word of God, the Bible. And so the last couple of weeks, we've looked at this theme, why the Bible. Stacy talked in the first week about what is the Bible? What is the Bible? And she said a really um, catchy little sentence to just sum up, what is the Bible? That it is a small library of books that emerged out of ancient Israel that tells the unified story of Jesus. It's a small library of books that emerged out of ancient Israel that tells the unified story of Jesus. But what I loved about that message was this. And when you find Jesus, you find life. When you find Jesus, when you encounter him, you've found everything. You've found the meaning of life. Last week, Justin, uh, in our home gatherings, taught so brilliantly on how to read and study the Bible, and he used some big technical terms around hermeneutics and exegesis. Uh, I was going to say, can anyone remember what they mean? Because I'm wanting to know. I can't remember. I'm, no, I'm only kidding. Exegesis is how you read and how you interpret the Scriptures. So when you open the Bible, it's important that you ask some questions so you get the right context. You've got to ask these questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. You've got to ask some questions about where, who was this written to and why was it written and how is it being applied to the day and how is it being applied to my life. And then today we're going to look at a really small topic, uh, which is around the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. And my wife went away for a girls' weekend, and uh, so I've been solo parenting over the weekend. My three children, well, my four children, because I've got a chocolate Labrador, uh, which is one year old, and that dog woke me up at 3.30 this morning, and I couldn't go back to sleep, and I was like, I know the Bible says children are a blessing from the Lord, I'm just not sure it says dogs are a blessing from the Lord, so, so I'm praying that this lands in our hearts this morning. We're going to look at the authority of Scripture. 
Isaiah, Old Testament book, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. That's a bold scripture. That's a bold declaration. Isaiah 55, 11, God says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is how confident God is in His word. He has spoken His word into existence. He's spoken His word into the hearts of men, and He's so confident that it will not return void, but it will accomplish that for which He sent it. Then we're going to look in the New Testament book of 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And this is a very famous scripture, this verse around the authority of scripture. And this is what it says. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Verse 17, I might not have it on the screen. That the man of God and the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture. That's a, that's a big statement. All Scripture. I don't know how many people here have read the whole Bible. There's some really challenging things in here. And Paul, the Apostle Paul who wrote... More letters in the New Testament than anyone else is saying that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable to build us up into who God's calling us to be. Now, if you are to say, I believe in that Scripture, I believe that that Scripture is true, then you are saying, I believe that the Bible holds the ultimate authority in my life. If you believe that all Scripture is breathed out by God, you are saying, I believe that this really is the words of God. And whatever God is saying in this book about Himself and about humanity is truth. The Bible also says that He is the potter and we are the clay. So however He wants to shape and mould our lives, He can do it because He's in authority. Now, this Wednesday just gone, whose is that? Did that, did that literally fall off your shirt? Uh, out of your Bible, sorry. Um, Wednesday just gone this week, I had my first boxing lesson. I know what you're thinking, you look like a boxer. Um, uh, why are you laughing? That's not a joke. I uh, had my first boxing lesson. Now, I'm not a massive, like I haven't watched a lot of boxing I've um, seen a little bit here and there. My son's gotten into boxing, so I'm watching him do it. But one thing I am thinking is when I am watching boxing, I'm like, I reckon I'd go pretty good if I got in that ring. I reckon if I put some gloves on, I'd jump in there and I'd have a good crack at it. You know? And as I'm watching boxing, I'm like, I'm looking at their stance and I'm thinking, you know, it's all front leg, it's all leaning forward like this. And my friend Geordie, I don't know if he's here today, but Geordie was, uh, he's a friend of mine, but he's also a professional teacher, and he starts to teach me the right way to stand and how to balance your weight and where to put your weight and how you, you spring off your back leg. And man, I felt like a baby giraffe, to be honest, who was learning to walk. I was so unco and uncoordinated. And he's like, he's Dutch, so he's got this epic Dutch accent. He's like, no, lucky, like this. Like, you swing your hips like this. And I'm like, mate, I'm nearly 40. These hips aren't swiveling like they used to. <laughs> And in that moment, I realized I don't have any authority in this ring. But Geordie has the authority, so I need to listen to Geordie. As the teacher, as the instructor, he's the one who's going to teach me how to do this, this thing called boxing properly. And this is the same as the Word of God. You might think you know about the Word of God. You might think you know about God, but it's not until you apply the Word of God to your life do you start to see the correct way God's calling you to be in relationship with Him and He's calling you to walk this out? And so to believe that Scripture, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable to train you up into who God's calling you to be. It's a big statement. 
In the context, we're going to apply a little bit of what Justin taught last week with exegesis. We're going to ask those questions. Who, who wrote it? This is the Apostle Paul who wrote this to Timothy. Timothy's his, his disciple, his young protege. The Apostle Paul took the gospel from Jerusalem out into all the Gentile nations, which Gentile just means non-Jewish, on his missionary journeys. And he's planted churches, established churches, preached the gospel, people got saved, set up a church, then he'd move on to the next city. And Paul preached the gospel in Ephesus, and a church is established in Ephesus, then he helps set up young Timothy to be the leader of the church in Ephesus, and Theologians would say that the church in Ephesus was about 20,000 believers strong, so a big church that this guy in his 30s is responsible for. And uh, Paul is writing this letter to encourage Timothy, but also to warn Timothy. Why? Because false teachers have infiltrated the church, like most of the letters in the New Testament. They're encouraging the church and they're warning the church against these false teachers. And this is, this is how he starts out. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpleasable, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. It says in verse 7, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. So the reason why Paul is writing this letter to Timothy is he saying, hey, Timothy, there's, there's many in the church who are starting to wander away from the truth. And how are they wandering away from the truth? It's because they're not in the Scriptures and they're not applying the Scriptures to their life. Ultimately, I think the reason why they've wandered away from the truth is because they've started to question the Word of God. And the Word of God, you've got to understand, the Word of God and the authority of God's Word has been questioned from the very beginning. And if you open up the first book of the Bible, Genesis, you'll see God created the heavens and the earth, creates mankind in His image. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we see humanity, Adam and Eve, are tempted into sin by the devil. And the way that they're tempted into sin is by the devil sowing the seed of doubt into their heart by simply asking a question. Did God actually say? Did God actually say? Did God actually say you couldn't eat from the fruit of the tree? Did God actually say? And that same question has been the same question that has been proposed to the hearts of men and women throughout the ages. Just to doubt the Word of God. Did, did God actually say? Did the Bible actually say that Jesus is the only way to be saved? Did God actually say, did the Bible actually say that marriage is only between a man and a woman? Did God actually say that sex outside of marriage is a sin? Did God actually say that? And there's probably many other things we could go into there. Did God actually say gossip is bad? All these things that you start to, in your journey of life, you start to question. It's because you're in a real spiritual battle and there is a real enemy that wants to sow doubt into your mind. So the, the Word of God and the authority of His Word is always being questioned. Now this topic, this is a big one. I've listened to more messages and read more books this week than probably any other message, so I might not completely land it. But this topic, I believe, opens a whole can of worms. It opens a whole number of tensions in the hearts of many just sitting in this room, but many in, in the world and I believe the view of the Bible or the view of religion in the world is mixed because of the things that have happened because of it. The wars that have happened, the abuse that has happened, the manipulation that has happened because of the Bible. Maybe you are, have been affected by one of those as you sit and listen to this message. I believe it can be hard for many people to believe that the Bible really is the Word of God. 
because the Bible has been used as a hammer to beat people instead of a meal to nourish people. And I just know this has happened in my own life and I know I've probably done this before in my own journey. I've used the Bible as a hammer instead of as this this meal to say to every single person, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, you open up these scriptures and you'll see that there's a God who's pursuing you. There's a God who loves you. There's a God who died for you. There's a God who has a plan for your life. But these questions start to burst open in our heart. And some of these questions are, how can I trust that it's the Word of God when man wrote it? How do I know that that human beings haven't tampered with it down through the ages and added their own interpretation? How do I really know what I'm reading now in 2024 is the same as what the early church was reading in the early start of the uh, centuries? Why should this book, the Bible, tell me what I can or can't do? These are real questions that I've had in my journey of faith. And I dare say they're real questions that you have here today. These can be real positions for many of us, even in the church. And even as a preacher, someone who gets up and preaches the word most weeks, I want to say this, I endeavor to get it right. I endeavor to preach the truth. I endeavor to serve the church in the best way possible, but I'm not always going to get it right. So it's important that every follower of Jesus has a position for themselves on the authority of Scripture. You can't just come and say, well, Locke said it. You actually have to take notes, write the Scriptures down, go home and say, is Locke preaching the truth? Is Locke pointing me to Jesus? This is why coming to church is not a show. Coming to church is like a gym. We're we're doing a little spiritual workout here. So if I can encourage you, write down some notes, write down some scriptures and go home for yourself and study it and get your own position on these topics like the authority of scripture. So to understand the authority of scripture, I believe we've got to even just understand what authority is. This is what the dictionary says. It says authority is the power or the right to give orders, to make decisions, and to enforce obedience. That's what the dictionary says authority is. Now, here's what I'd say biblical authority is. Biblical authority is the power to reveal who God is, what he thinks about humanity, and how he wants us to live. Biblical authority is the power to reveal who God is, what he thinks about humanity, and how he wants us to live. Now, as Christians, we are on a journey of following Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, who came from heaven to earth, put on skin and bone, walked the earth, and and wasn't just there to die for our sins so that we can be redeemed into a relationship with the Father. But He came to be our example. He came to be the model for humanity. He came to show us actually how we're supposed to live. And this is what amazes me. Although he's God in flesh, he modeled what it was like to live under authority. This is amazing. Look at this in John chapter 12, verse 49 to 50. Jesus says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me as himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. This is Jesus speaking to the people in Israel. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God and what it looks like. And the Son of God in flesh models, hey, I'm doing this under authority. I'm doing this under authority. But the Jews who he's teaching to and who he's preaching to, they don't like this. They get angry because Jesus is calling God his Father and he's calling himself one with the Father. And they hated that because they thought Jesus was abusing God's name and abusing God's authority. But Jesus is modeling to the world, hey, not even I, the Son of God, am doing this journey outside of under authority. And even modeled that he held Scripture as the highest authority. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus is baptized and he starts his earthly ministry and the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and 40 nights... It's there that the devil comes and tempts him. In Luke chapter 4, verse 3 to 4, it says this, The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. He hasn't eaten for 40 days, so he's hungry. 
And Jesus answered him, do you know who I am? Are you, are you kidding me, Lucifer, Satan? Do you know who I am? I'm Je- That's just not how Jesus answered him. Jesus answered the devil, this created being, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. What's Jesus doing? He's quoting Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Jesus is not only modelling he's under authority, but he's modelling that he held Scripture to the highest authority. He's modelling to us, and it's now written down for all of the ages that you and I would see that even the Son of God believed that the Word of God carried the ultimate power and authority. That's how he refuted. That's how he rebuked the devil. Didn't say, you know who I am. I'm God in flesh. He says, it's written. Man shall not live by bread alone. Now we have a humanity and a society that wants to question authority on every level. And especially after the last season of COVID, I believe that that we're even in a season of people are questioning more things than they've ever questioned. And I say, yeah, for good reason. Some dodgy stuff went down and some dodgy stuff's now coming out about what happened in that last season. And when authority is abused, I believe it becomes untrustworthy. But we've got to understand, it actually goes much deeper than just COVID. Anti-authority is in our DNA. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they were tempted by the devil, they, were, they entered into sin. And every human being that's been born after Adam and Eve is born with a sin nature. Sin means to miss the mark of God's holy standard. It means to rebel. So you and I have to understand that when we're born into this world, our natural predisposition is not to go towards God, it's to go away from God. Our natural predisposition is not to say, oh, wow, the Holy Scriptures, I'm going to surrender my life to the Word of God. Our natural predisposition is to say, no, I'm going to do it my own way. Our natural predisposition is actually anti-authority. So when it comes to the authority of God and the authority of the Bible, it actually comes down to a trust issue. Do I trust that these words are the very words of God? If I do, and if you do, we will apply them to our life. But if we don't, we will resist them. And this is ultimately why Paul is writing this letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy. He's writing this letter because there has been many who have started to walk away from the Scriptures, walk away from surrendering their life and obeying and coming under the authority of the Word. So Paul is writing this letter to encourage Timothy. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the encouragement Paul is saying. Hey, Stay close to the Word. Stay close to the Scriptures. Why? Because these Scriptures are going to give you revelation of who Jesus Christ is, and it's going to unlock something in your life that's of eternal value. So why should the Bible be our authority? I'm going to get the keys up as I spend just a few more moments here. Why should the Bible be our authority? Whenever I ask a question... To myself, whenever I'm studying the Bible or whenever I'm on this journey of faith and I have a question, I often ask a question and then end up answering it with another question. It's just, it's a weird thing that I do, but I think this is even how God and the Jewish people, God, you know, brought in the scriptures back in that, the, the Hebrews time that they would, they would discuss the scriptures by asking questions and answering questions. This is how these young Jewish boys would grow up. They'd learn the Scriptures by keeping a dialogue happening, asking questions and answering questions. So I ask the question, why should the Bible be my authority? I sit there and think, how do we know we can even trust the Bible? How do I know I can even trust this? Maybe you got saved, I don't know, a number of years ago and you just came in supernaturally into this relationship with God and you've just had this position all of a sudden like, I just trust it. 
I just believe that it's the Word of God. I've just never doubted. Or maybe you're someone who's just like, ah, oh, just, I've always had a wrestle. How do I really trust that the Bible is accurate? Like, think about the history of the Bible. There's 66 books in here, written by 40 authors that spans the writing time over 1,500 years on three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. How can you trust that? That's crazy to say, I'm gonna trust. All those 40 different authors that this one whole thing is gonna be the authority of my life. That's a huge statement. What's beautiful about the Bible is it tells one unified story of Jesus Christ and of God's love for humanity and God's plan to redeem creation. You may have seen, I'm gonna put this image up on the screen of the cross references of the Bible. Has anyone seen this? It was made popular recently by the prophet Jordan Peterson. Uh, <laughs> This is an image of the cross references in the Bible, 63,799 cross references interwoven all throughout the Scriptures from the beginning of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation, 63,799 cross references interwoven, interlocking, speaking about one verse thousands of years down the road and that that book speaking about that book and that verse thousands of years back down the road. And you look at that and you would say, if anyone could write a book like this with this many references in it, cross references, that person would be a genius. That person would be a master author if they were able to do that. Let alone 40 people writing it over the span of 1500 years. And this is what we end up with. Something that speaks continually all throughout the pages about the one unified story of God's love for humanity and God's plan to redeem creation. So how did the Bible come together? Did it just appear one day? Leather bound book just dropped out of heaven and it was like, whoa, the Bible, this is so epic. There are certain religions and faiths out there where that happened, supposedly. An angel delivered golden, a golden book, golden tablets. Now, this is what's crazy. God chooses to use humanity and the brokenness of humanity to bring about His divine inspiration. It's mind-blowing. And it encourages me going, God, if you can use these people across this span of time, then you can use my broken life and you can interweave your plan in and through my life to bring about your purposes for your glory. How did the Bible come together? Just gonna teach on this just for a little bit, just so we have some understanding. Stacy taught in week one about the Old Testament books of the Bible, which is called the Tanakh. It's what the Hebrew Bible is. And it's what we agree as, as our Old Testament. But then Jesus comes into the, the middle of the story. And He brings about a new covenant. He brings about a new plan. Do you know that word testament? So we've got the Old Testament, we've got the New Testament. The word testament just literally means covenant. Jesus comes because He wants to establish a new covenant. And He does that. We shared communion. He does it by dying on the cross, spilling His blood and His body being broken for our sins. That's how Jesus establishes His new covenant. And He says, I want you to go into all the world. I want you to make disciples and baptising them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've taught you. And so His apostles, those 12 people that He chose, go on this journey of starting to document the life of Christ. And that's where we get the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those men have written this account of Jesus by what they saw or by conversations they've had of people who experienced those things. 
And then you get those apostles. As the church has started, they start to write these letters, which are called epistles. And these letters are sent out to the churches to encourage them and to help keep them on track. And you've got to look at all these things because these books that we have in the Bible were not the only books that were written at that time. So how did we end up with these books in the Bible? It's a word called canonization. That word canon is a Greek word which literally means measuring rod. So how we got the Old, can- Old Testament canon is, is through the Hebrew Scriptures. How we get the New Testament canon is super interesting because there's different councils that happened that ended up recognising the divine inspiration of certain books and what certain books weren't divinely inspired. And so you sit there going, how did this Bible come together? Did the Pope just decide it? The, the Pope of the Catholic Church? Did these church councils decide the canon? No, what we have to understand, it's crucial that we understand that the canonization of the Bible, which just means putting these books into the Bible, wasn't man's idea. It was God's idea from the start. It actually wasn't about the Pope. It wasn't about the councils. It was about the heart of God that inspired the Scriptures through His people that we end up with the New Testament, with these books in this canon. This is what Michael Kruger, who's a biblical scholar, says. He says, In ancient cultures, whenever there would be an agreement made, it was called a covenant. It was a cultural tradition that history was passed down orally through stories. But when a covenant was made, it was, it was written down. And it was always written down either on two documents or two stones. So God giving Moses on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus chapter 20, God giving Moses two tablets of stone with the commandments was very fitting for the time. But it was also prophetic, pointing to the fact that there would also be two covenants. I thought this was amazing just to see how interwoven and interlocked the whole story is. So the process of canonization is the church recognising what books are in the Bible and what books are divinely inspired and what books aren't. Because those books aren't the only books that are written. And you might know this, there's the Gospel of Thomas, there's the Gospel of Peter, but they didn't make it in the canonization of the Bible. And how did that happen? It's because there were a certain few things that they would ask when they would go to put a Bible in the canon of Scripture. Four questions for the canonization of the New Testament. The first one was, was the author an apostle or a close connection? Is the book being accepted by the body of Christ at large? Did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? Did the book bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect the work of the Holy Spirit? And through all of these books that have been chosen, you read through, if you open up your Bible and you see one common consistent thread all pointing to Jesus as Lord. So God inspires His His Word through human beings, broken human beings, and He allows them even to be in the process of forming the Bible. But we've got to realise that it wasn't the church giving the Scriptures authority. What we see in the New Testament, even our writers of the New Testament letters who were referring to other writers of the New Testament letters as Scripture. So the, the canon was being formed even as they were writing it. How do we know that the Bible is accurate? It's through the, the canonization of the Scriptures. Second one in this point is how do we know the Bible is accurate? It's through the historical accuracy. See, a major way that historians would record the validity and the accuracy of any writings is by how many copies were made of them and the time frame by which they were copied. I'm just going to put this uh, table on this image on the screen. These are all historical documents and writers, Caesar, Plato, Tacitus, I think is Tacitus is how you say it, Homer. All these writers, you can see when they've written it. Caesar, 100 to 44 BC, before Christ. And the earliest copy that was made was 900 CE or AD. 
It's like a thousand years later, the first copy of Caesar's writings was made. And yet no one on earth would doubt that Caesar was real and the stuff that he wrote was real. And you work your way down and you see all these other writings and the year that they wrote them and then the year of the earliest copy. And then you come down, look at that. There's 10 copies of Caesar, seven copies of Plato, 20 copies of Tacitus, 643 copies of Homer. And then you come down to the New Testament written 40, between 40 and 90 CE or AD. And we find that we have 41,000 686 manuscripts. So just in pure historical evidence, the amount of times that the New Testament was copied is the most in human history of any other writings of any other book. This is amazing. And we look at how many times those this is what historians will look at is how many times something was copied and by the time frame it was copied. And you can see the time frame, it's literally around 100 years after the finished writings of the New Testament that we start to see the first manuscripts put together. Then we see the second objection we get around the accuracy of the New Testament and that's around the different variations that we have throughout the manuscripts. The early church were far more concerned about getting the gospel out than they were doing perfect copying of each manuscript. So we see across the 41,000 manuscripts that we have hundreds of thousands of variations. But what are those variations and why do they matter? Because this is when I talk to anyone, they say the Bible can't be trusted. The Bible's flawed, like it's, there's so many different copies and there's so many different variations of the manuscripts, but you've got to ask, what are the variations and why does it matter? So to figure out their importance, we don't look at the number of variations, we look at the nature of the variations. And at least 99.8% of the variations between those 41,000 manuscripts are spelling or grammar errors. No essential doctrine or teaching is jeopardised by the variations. We can trust that the Bible has been carefully protected and preserved throughout time. This is amazing. Why should the Bible be an authority in the believer's life? It's because of how the Bible has been canonised. We have recognised the divinely inspired books of the Bible then we also see the historical accuracy of those writings. Now, you might be sitting here this morning saying, so what, Locke? (laughs) I don't really care. How does this apply to my life in 2024? Well, the question I asked when I was coming to faith in, in God was how does this carry any power? How do these scriptures, how do these writings actually carry any power? If this scripture that Paul is saying, all of scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. How does the Bible carry power? Because as people, as humanity, we are always looking to something that will ultimately bring the deep answers to the questions of our heart. We're looking for transformation. We're not just looking for information. We're looking to to those questions to be answered. That's why you get millions of books that are written and movies that are made like The Da Vinci Code and The Secret, because they're all trying to answer the questions Why? Why? Why do we want that answer? Is because people are searching for truth. It's not until you find truth that you truly are set free. It's what Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So we are looking for something that carries truth and carries power. And we want to know the answer to the question, can this change my life. And you'll tell the authority of something.
by when you apply it to your life, if it actually carries enough power to change your life. Justin referenced this scripture last week, week, Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I don't know about you, but whenever I read that scripture, I'm like, whoa, that's intimidating. That is intimidating. This Word carries power. It's the only book that reads you. I love the quote that he said last week. It's the only book where the author comes and sits with you while you're reading it. I don't know about you, but in my journey of life and all the ups and downs and the struggles that I have, I wanna know that I'm surrendering my life to a God who's powerful. I wanna know I'm surrendering my life to a God who says that His Word carries power. I wanna know that I'm surrendering my life to a God who's, who says, who is who He says He is and can do what He says He can do. That's what I wanna be a part of. That's who I wanna walk with. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Many of you know the journey that my family has walked through the last couple of months with my brother-in-law passing away. And honestly, as soon as he passed away, the, the story of Scripture that bounced to the forefront was this one, Matthew 7. Whoever hears these words and does them will be like a wise man who builds his life on the rock. And although the wind comes and the rain comes and the floods and the storms of life come, your house will not be knocked over. Your house will not be shaken because you are firmly fixed on who Jesus Christ is and the power of His Word. And I wanna say to anyone out there who would be thinking and searching and wondering, does the Bible carry power? My life is a testimony and there are hundreds of testimonies of people in this room who have built their life on Jesus and the power of His Word. And they can say, today I'm still standing no matter what I walk through. Humanity is searching for the question, does this carry power to change my life? Now I'm gonna put an image on the screen and this is of a YouTube um, video that I watched called The God Debate. I don't know if anyone here has seen this, but it's between Richard Dawkins and Ayan. Hasi Ali, I think her name is. Richard Dawkins, obviously one of the most famous atheists in the world, and so was Ayan. But I'll share a little bit of Ayan's story. She grew up as a Muslim in Somalia, and she turned away from Islam because of the horrific things that she encountered. Then because of those horrific things, she ended up becoming an atheist. Later, she became a politician and was announced as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. She ended up becoming actually one of the most famous atheists in the world. But little did anyone know that Ayan was severely depressed. For the last 10 years, she only became a Christian just recently, but for the last 10 years, Ayan has been severely depressed. No matter all the millions of copies of her books that she sold, all the incredible intelligent things that she shared, she would go home by herself and she would be thinking about how she's going to take her life. No one knew the struggle she was having. No one knew the journey she was on. No one knew the depth of brokenness in her life. And she started to see a psychologist. And as she was on this journey with the psychologist, she said the psychologist put words that helped frame up where she was at. And the psychologist said, what you're experiencing right now, Ayan, is spiritual bankruptcy. And she said, as those words were spoken, it pierced her heart so deep. And she said, you've tried everything, but I encourage you, when you get in your car on the way home, I want you just to try and pray to God. She said she gets in her car and she starts to pray to God and she literally feels life coming back into her being. And then Richard Dawkins, if you've ever seen any of his stuff, he's sitting there and he's like, you're not serious, hey. He says, you, 
you don't really believe in the Bible, do you? Like that is a load of, and, uh, <laughs> and he just says, he just starts absolutely shredding strips off Christianity and off the Word of God. And this lady who is at the end of the line wanting to take her life looks back in total peace and says, I've experienced His life-changing power. And He says, so when you read the Scriptures, you actually believe there was a real Jesus who went to a cross and rose from the dead? And she's like, I do believe that. One of the top 100 most influential people in the world was spiritually bankrupt until she came to Christ. Does the Word carry power? You better believe it carries power. There is power in the Word. And this is why we're doing this series, just so we're not a church who's built on emotion and built on experience, but we're a people who are built on the Word of God. Why? Because the Word carries power. If you want to be transformed, if you want to experience the fullness of God, you've got to open up the Scriptures and you've got to start to drink from the living water of His Word. I want to encourage you, friends, the Word carries power. Why? Because the Word is Jesus. This is the most amazing thing about the Gospel. And the Gospel just literally means good news. But the Gospel says that the Word isn't just some words written on pages. The Word is a person. So when you come in relationship with the person who is Jesus Christ, you come in relationship with the Word of God. And the Gospel of John starts out like this and says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is why Christianity is far above. This is why Christianity is the only living religion because God didn't stay in the heavens. God came. The Word of God who spoke the universe into being and said, let there be light. Planets sit in the universe. Stars sit over here. Earth, you're going to be like this. That Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the apostles who are writing these Scriptures are being like, hey, we saw Him. We touched Him. We experienced Him. I'm going to get the band up so we can worship before we finish. The Word became flesh. Friend, when you come into relationship with God, you come into relationship not just with the Scriptures, but you come into relationship with the living God, the Word, Jesus Christ. And this Word became flesh. And this Word went to the cross for the sin of humanity. And this Word died on the cross. Jesus died on that cross for you and for me because He loves us. This is the story of the Bible. He loves us. And He died on that cross and the judgment of a holy God was poured out on Jesus so that it wouldn't have to be poured out on you or poured out on me. And He went lifeless into a tomb and on the third day, The Word came back to life. And this is what Tim Keller says, a famous pastor in America who passed away recently. He said, if the resurrection is true, then everything is going to be okay. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ is real, then everything is going to be okay. The wind can come, the rain can come, the floods can come. But if your life is built on the Word, Jesus, man, you're going to experience life like you've never experienced it. You're going to experience the living water. You're going to experience the reason for existence. You're going to experience God dwelling within you. This is the promise of the Gospel.